of my talk today are to um, share some theories on musical activity and to also uh, look at some cross-disciplinary ways that, that, that I can identify that might help answer problems uh, that, that have solutions and more importantly go beyond problems because most of our modern problems are not problems at all. They're paradoxes and dilemmas that don't necessarily have readily accessible solutions. And I think the arts uh, can help explain uh, some of this and I'll, I'll use these slides to, to get there. I want to talk about oscillations quickly, though. Uh, I found this great book by Itzhak Bentov called Stalking the Wild Pendulum. Anyone know that book? Yeah, I don't even know how I found it. But, <laughs> but I read the thing on a bus going between Western Massachusetts and, and Boston, which actually takes a very long time. And, and it just blew my mind. And, and he talks about oscillations in the book. And in the first chapter, and he talks about sound, which, which really interested me. And Bentov writes, quote, oscillators are devices that move in a periodic, repetitive fashion between two points of rest. Our bodies are also such devices, end quote. And that, that really threw me for a loop. And I, I started thinking about more and more oscillations. And even this talk was an oscillation between procrastination and hard work. At least I thought it was hard work. I hope it pays off. Uh, there were moments when I was the hero and I thought, my talk is very easy, I'm going to solve the world's problems. And then other moments when I thought, uh, I don't deserve to do this, I'm a complete failure, I don't know why they asked me, I don't know why I said yes. And, and those oscillations were going on. Uh, I think even the theme, tomorrow today, uh, is, is more like an oscillation than a dichotomy. And, and I loved the idea that it started to spin my mind into uh, notions that would go past uh, the idea of Western past, present, and future. And when I came to think about the theme more and more, I thought that maybe when an oscillation is pushed too hard, it turns into a dichotomy. And when we push an, push an oscillation even harder, it might turn into a false dichotomy. And I started to think about the dark lines we've drawn between academic disciplines as false dichotomies and maybe oscillations that have been pushed too hard. My own story for this goes back to when I was 12. I was in my bedroom up late doing my algebra homework and I was crying. And um, <laughs> my dad must have sensed this and he woke up and he came into my room and he just looked at me and he looked at the math book and looked at me again and he, he exclaimed in a pretty intense way, he said, Vince, Math is easy. Half the answers are in the back of your book. The other half of the answers are in your teacher's book. <laughs> Life is not easy. Life has no answers. And then he disappeared. And, <laughs> and I sat in the room and I looked at the book for a few more minutes and then I thought, I, I, I'm an artist. All right, that's it. No more math. And then consciously and subconsciously, I started to depart from the sciences and the maths and, and things like that and found more and more my identity and my, my bass playing. And, and um, I, don't, I don't know if that, that was exactly right. But uh, what I've come up with today is this three, three sort of theories on musical activity. And, and the other thing that always happens to me is, is people always come up to me at weddings, get togethers, what have you, and they say, oh wow, you're a musician. I, I love music. I, I love all music except for country. <laughs> or, <laughs> or they'll say I love all music except for rap. And, uh, or I love all music except for country and rap. And, and um, I'm, I'm just bowled over in the, the best way by this, this positive love for music. And, and part of my research years ago was to ask why people love music so much, but when it comes time to fund it in institutions, it becomes so difficult. And, and also even like how can a Napster evolve and what, why are the, the, there are these proprietary problems with musical activity when it seems to be so much at our core. And, and it caused me to come up with this, this first theory and this, this one um, is the one I'll talk about the most today. Um, my theory is that musical activity allows for multiple contradictory or complementary ideas to exist simultaneously. And that's my best writing, and it's not, it, it doesn't sound very good, but, but I'll prove it to you through, through some activity. If you can, at a forte, kind of loud volume, turn to your neighbor and please talk to them when I say go about rowing boats and sailing and water. On your mark, get set, go. Okay, thank you. All right, good, good, good. 
And, and that sound, I think the, the musical term, maybe not a musical term, would be cacophony. And we, we would say that makes no sense. And linear sequential language does not allow for multiple ideas uh, to be expressed simultaneously. Even if you want to argue with me, you'll probably stop when I ask you to think of when you're on your phone and you're talking to someone, you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. And somebody comes up to you and starts talking. And, and for me, it, it, right here, it feel, I feel it right in the center. It's like, no, 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 no. I can't do two things at once in linear sequential thought. But in the arts, we can. And so to prove that, may I divide the room sort of into thirds, rough thirds. Remember, I stopped at algebra. Uh, so, and what I'd like you to do is, you'll, you'll get this uh, by the time we get to that group. The first group, I'll, I'll, I'll come in with you, we're going to sing, row, row, row your boat, and keep going once I turn to this group, because I've got to cue them in, okay? So here we go, ready? Row, row, row your boat. Okay, and we can stop there. I, it's a sin to stop you. Um, I, I'm not the first to try a TED choir. Ben Zander and, of course, um, I think Bobby McFerrin beat me to it. But uh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, should be a round of applause. For one second, I was just standing here, just enjoying it so much, and it reminded me of seeing the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra recently. A great conductor, Abado, came, and he conducted them on Beethoven 5, and they sounded awesome. They were tearing the paint off the walls, and he stood on the podium at one point, and he just smiled, and he just let them play. And I thought, that's the smartest guy in the room. He is getting paid to stand there and listen to great music. <laughs> And I just did it too. I, I don't think I'm getting paid. But the, the row, row, row your boat. <laughs> I stopped at algebra. Uh, <laughs> row, row, row your boat uh, is an example of, of these ideas to exist simultaneously. And this is what I love about music so much. When I play I, in a symphony, I love that there are sometimes even a hundred ideas going on at once. And we're able to perceive these and enjoy. Uh, I studied um, Christopher Small. I loved him so much, loved his books. I went to interview him when he was 80. I stayed for 10 days in Spain, uh, asking him questions, making him thoroughly tired. He, he wrote a book called Music Society Education. And, and that was his groundwork in 1977 to, to write two more books, where he talked about how music is a sophisticated form of communication. And for humans, it allows us to explore who we are, affirm who we are celebrate that, and even survive. And he had studied science, uh, even had a science degree, and he talked a lot about how plants and ecology must be doing these negotiations as well in order to survive. And I've got one next theory, and this one is where, where I ask for interdisciplinary help and where cross-disciplinary help uh, can, can come into play. This is called cymatics. Cymatics is, uh, uh, if I, I'm going to give a very pedestrian description, uh, apparently scientists can get highly purified water and use a cymoscope, which I understand is a really powerful microscope, and uh, look at the crystalline forms in water when they play music at the water. And here's what it looks like. And uh, the first thought I had was this. Uh, maybe we love music because of something we can't even see, and that would be worthy of making some cross-disciplinary connections. Uh, I have often talked to my students uh, about this, too. I, I, when, when they get bored, I say, well, hey, where do your instruments come from? And, and you get the glib answer, someone will say the music store, and then someone else says, well, trees, if, if you're in the strings class. And I say, where do the band instruments come from? And someone will say metal ore. And I say, well, where do trees and ore come from? And they'll say the earth. And then I say, well, what's the earth made out of? And often we agree that it's made out of minerals and, and decomposing things and death and, and recycling. And, and, and then I look at them and I say, orchestra, when we play, we are making the earth resonate. Um, we're making the planet resonate. We're trying to make something bigger than ourselves. We're trying to unite past, present, and future when we're performing. And uh, Bentov, I spoke of earlier on oscillation, wrote, quote, our bodies generate electrostatic fields of their own. When in the meditative state, our bodies go into resonance with the electric field of the planet, end quote. And uh, I like that idea, and, and these might be reasons music's important. Here's another. I'll let you read it.
I've shown this slide to thousands of people, and every time I always say, does that really happen? Do you feel a little happy and a little sad simultaneously? Do you? And they all look at me with the same faces, kind of despondent, like, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> I found this quote, and I want to introduce this person, but he's not going to let me. He'll introduce himself. My conclusion is that I am neither fish nor fowl, and you who know me already know what I thought of when I read that. I thought of this. And I started to get really into stuff like this, these sort of oscillations without an excluded middle. And, and again, the arts presenting two ideas simultaneously, contradictory or complementary. And then I found this, this is just way too much <laughs> stuff going on, but it's all there. The fur line teacup. It's one of my favorites because it invites and it also denies. And then this one's a little dark on the bottom, but it's a Civil War uh, tea service in silver uh, next to what an, uh, an artist put in a museum uh, installation with shackles. And again, complementary or contradictory ideas simultaneously through the arts. And then I found this weird one. <laughs> and I'll let you uh, think about that. <laughs> and then we need to turn to music. I used art because it's often a little easier to do things visually in such a visual society. But in music, I was sitting in a chair one day, and um, my great friend, Corey Fogel, who's a wonderful artist in Los Angeles, wonderful musician, he was just here visiting. He reminded me that we used to live together as roommates in college, and we'd go to the thrift store and buy weird records and go back to the apartment, and every time he would sit there and he'd say, what if this is the best music we've ever heard in our lives? <laughs> and, and so ever since that, I've always sat down every time I'm going to hear something, I think, what, is the best, what if this is the best music I'm ever going to hear in my life? And so I was listening to Rufus Wainwright, and uh, I heard this song that literally knocked me out of my chair. I mean, I really had to get out of the chair. And what he did is he set this text of the Christian liturgy. This is the last part of the Mass, uh, and it's repetitive, it's simple, it's definitely got a message. He, he set this text in a way that really, really, really threw me off. And again, it was this idea of multiple contradictory or complementary ideas presented in simultaneity through the arts. And I'll play a little bit of it. So listening to that, I thought, wow, he, he set the text of the Christian liturgy to what I heard, especially living in the States at that time, is stereotypical Middle Eastern music. And I thought, wow, he's united to, to extremes through the arts and, and kind of was just really blown away by that. Uh, and so my, my thoughts here uh, is if we let the arts do what they do and if we let them present these ideas in simultaneity, uh, how much fun would it be to, to go back and re-include or, or to bring in all the other disciplines and to do all these things like what these talks are about today uh, on, on connecting ourselves and reconnecting ourselves. I have found uh, some other work here, but it's getting older and older, uh, which worries me because it's even my own resistance to being more interdisciplinary. But Mary Cohen thought that music therapy and music education may merge in our lifetime, which is exciting. They probably should. And I found this, which is one of the most interesting things I've ever read, through storytelling. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, the great writer, the Tao physics writer, and also the Turning Point and other books Fritjof Kappa wrote.
He wrote about the ecology of our exploration. And again, I wonder about my resistance to this when it seems so, so there and so ripe and ready. And I have to uh, show this slide. I drive by this every day, and my immediate response is always sort of us, them response. Well, I don't do that. They're over there. Uh, even though the school's adjacent to our school, you'd think I'd walk over and say hi or something, or, or maybe they'd come over and say hi to me, I don't know. But that weird us-them resistance needs to be worked over, I think, and we need to acknowledge that collaboration is hard work, and it doesn't always go right the first time. Um, but then I was looking around uh, the school uh, here, and, and I found this from the Alice Smith School. It says, congratulations on your 50th anniversary. And, and I thought, wow, there is collaboration. There are people going back and forth. I just need to open myself more and, and look for this. Um, Howard Gardner, the Harvard psychologist, noted that truth, which might be science, beauty, the arts, and goodness, morality, were all connected at one point. And he said before modern Western secular society, uh, these connections were there. He cites John Keats uh, tantalizing ode on a Grecian urn inscription that reads, quote, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know, end quote. And finally, to conclude, I wanted to read something that Leonard Schlein wrote. He wrote a book called Art and Physics, and he writes, quote, the Romans introduced a male god Janus who had no Greek antecedent. I suspect that Techni and Janus are closely related. In mythology, Janus is the two-faced god. I propose that we, each of us, must become like Janus. He occupies the space of a threshold and looks both forward and back in a single moment in time, noting what is past and what is becoming. From the core of the past to the edge of the future, Janus scans two views in space and time simultaneously. If we think of one face as art and the other as physics, these two perspectives invite us to change the way we see and consider the world. Seemingly divergent in the direction of their visions, the artist and the physicist lime for us revisions of reality." End quote. Uh, that was where I was going to end, but I wanted to really quick um, hearken to Jin's talk. I won't call him Ginny Boy. I find it interesting that he wanted to fly around the world for free, and now he does fly around. He just flies inside a YouTube. If you view YouTube as a, a plane, I do. Um, his story reminded me that when I was 17, I borrowed my parents' car without telling them what I was going to do. And I borrowed a bass from the school without telling my music teacher what I was going to do. And I drove to the university and um, I auditioned for their music program. And everyone said, don't go into music, you can't do it, it won't work, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And, and I even had to lie to kind of get, get around the thing. And um, I got there, and as a high school bassist, I didn't have lessons or anything like that. I didn't know what a sonata was or a concerto. And so as a high school bassist, your, your music is mostly like boom, 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 boom. And so I picked the hardest piece out of my folder, which was the Hallelujah Chorus, because there's actually some stuff in there, and I thought I better play the hardest piece for these guys. And, and I didn't know it was the Hallelujah Chorus, it just said the Messiah on it. So I walked into the audition room, there are these music professors there, and they say, what are you going to play? And I said, the Messiah. And they, they started laughing. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, this is not going well. And, <laughs> and I never heard back from them, ever. But guess what? I still went into music and I did what I wanted to do. And I hope that's encouraging to everybody. If you already know what you want to do, go do it, because it's probably going to happen anyway. Thank you so much.